Welcome everyone to the first uh, ARC Salon. Uh, these salons are intended to um, really kind of make accessible um, uh, to a wide audience uh, some of the fascinating uh, big picture thinking going on. Uh, one of the whole um, kind of mission statements of uh, of ARC is to yeah try to get out into the public these ideas uh, in a meaningful way uh, uh, so that they're not... Um, one sort of limited to you know uh ivory tower theorists uh but on the other hand uh that they're actually you know finding ways to be meaningfully integrated into people's lives and into the kind of popular consciousness uh that's sort of the basic idea here um and uh so we're really excited to start this out today uh with our first uh guest dr greg enriquez who uh is a professor of psychology at james madison university uh, and the formulator of the Unified Theory of Knowledge, which he'll be talking about uh, in a minute. Author of a couple of books. Uh, there's a sure. 2011, there's a New Unified Theory of Psychology. Uh, was that? And then in, in uh, just this past year, uh, Greg released uh, a really impressive tome, uh, A New Synthesis for Solving the Problem of Psychology. Uh, and um, so anyway, yeah, uh, what we want to kind of do here is um, begin with sort of kind of giving Greg the floor um, and uh, give you an opportunity, Greg, to kind of talk about what is UTOC, the Unified Theory of Knowledge, um, what's it do, what's it good for, uh, give us sort of an overview, and then we'll open things up and uh, see where the conversation takes us. So anyway, thanks so much, Greg. Really appreciate you being here. Hey, it's uh, very happy to be here. Uh, given the nature of this group, let's make it conversational. Uh, so I'll give you an overview, a conversational overview of Utah. Stop me at any time. Uh, and and I would really like to, you know, get to know you. Uh, so if you could say a little bit about yourself and we can, you know, have a group conversation here. It's one of the nice things about eight people uh, or, or whatever is that we can chat. Uh, so feel free. Uh, let's make it engaging in that way. Um, but as we get oriented, let's just orient to this thing called the Unified Theory of Knowledge. Um, and so let me get clear about what the word unified means. Um, so unified is a direct uh, descendant and lineage to the word consilience, um, uh, which is <laughs> directly descended to the word unified <laughs> uh, on the other side. Uh, consilience is a term that Edward Wilson uh, sort of brought to the fore. It had a history, but it wasn't used much. In 1997, uh, he was working and published in 1998 a book called Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge. Um, E.O. Wilson was a big, broad thinker. Uh, he was a natural scientist who had founded uh, and spearheaded the uh, discipline of sociobiology. Uh, that's how it's got its own history. Um, but he was really interested in a coherent, big picture view uh, that would start with the natural sciences, go into the social sciences and humanities, and afford a way to think about education uh, from a coherent framework. Uh, now, although consilience gets a lot of attention uh, and certainly sparks a lot of discussion, it certainly doesn't achieve its goal. Um, and uh, the unified theory uh, comes along and basically says, hey, uh, I can speak Edward Wilson's language um, as a natural scientist, and I can tell you why uh, Edward Wilson uh, has some pieces of the puzzle that are very important and correct, and why he had this idea that we could see a, a whole uh, patterned integrated landscape uh, that sort of combined or made in right relation the natural sciences, the social sciences, and humanities, um, but why he also failed uh, at that. Um, and the answer as to why he failed from my vantage point is that there is a profound problem um, that is preventing coherence from being achieved that can be diagnosed, that can be specified, and that can be corrected. Um, and my book right here, <laughs> um, this book, uh, based in its title, clarifies what that problem is. Uh, so it's the title of this book is A New Synthesis for Solving the Problem of Psychology, Addressing the Enlightenment Gap. Huh? Um, so what's that? Uh, the problem of psychology is the problem of, uh, that's what I am. I'm a clinical theoretical psychologist uh, and have lived in the world of psychology since 
you know, sort of my birth as a trained knower. <laughs> um, and I majored in it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so what is the problem of psychology? Well, um, first we want to contain it in relationship. What do I mean by psychology? I mean the institution of thought that emerged in the context of the Enlightenment, where people tried to systematically place the discipline of psychology in the context of the natural sciences. Okay, So the natural sciences emerge, you get a Galileo into Newton and Francis Bacon and other people, and then the natural sciences are in their heyday, uh, and you get uh, the 19th century uh, sees the explosion of a number of different uh, approaches uh, uh, to try to place whatever this thing, this ref referent, refers to the concept of psychology in the context of the natural sciences. Okay. Um, and what happens in that is that a bunch of different approaches and schools of thought emerge. Okay. And they try to frame psychology in radically different ways. And, and you can go through a lot of different uh, angles on this. I'll just give you four major schools uh, of thought that should be familiar if you know anything about the history of sort of this. But the first major school of thought uh, is founded by v Wundt, Wilhelm Wundt. And indeed, most people date the official institution of psychology's birth date to 1879, um, when Wilhelm Wundt opened his lab, had a journal, and was embarked on the process of understanding what psychology is and was. Um, what Wilhelm Wundt focused on was human introspection. Um, and he wanted to use systematic introspection, internal observations of trained observers, to understand sensation into perception, into apperception, okay? Uh, which is basically, hey, how does the stuff emerge behind your eyes and what form does it take and how do we systematically investigate that? Um, uh, when that gets transported over to the United States by a student, Edward Titchener, it becomes structuralism. And in that regard, then the science of psychology is about the structure of human subjective experience through systematic introspection. Okay. So that's one version of what psychology is. All right. In other words, and train people, look inside yourself, report back, do various methods to try to track that and build a science of what that stuff is, the structure of the experience behind your eyes. Okay. Uh, you get another approach, William James, uh, who is uh, certainly concerned with consciousness, but he's concerned with the role that consciousness plays in the way in which animals and humans adapt to their world. Um, and he thinks of psychology as this mental life, uh, which is the process by which consciousness in both animals and humans enables us to adapt to the world. And this becomes called functionalism. So here you have the psychology being, hey, it's the sort of functional awareness and responsivity of animals and persons to their environment. Uh, so William James, the father of American psychology, is a functionalist versus a structuralist. Um, there's another approach that basically comes along in, uh, in America, and that is n both this idea that we need consciousness, either its structure or its function to explain what people are doing. is inconsistent with natural science, both its method and its uh, ontology. And this is John Watson comes along with classic behaviorism. And he applies both the me methods of science, which is an experimentation of stimulus response association. That's how he frames the experimental methods of si natural science and argues that natural science is really a physicalist ontology, meaning that there's a mechanistic unfolding of cause effect and or to, for psychology to be a natural science, although he doesn't really differentiate, this becomes important, the epistemology from the ontology, he basically adopts both full scale and behaviorism becomes the experimental analysis of stimulus response relations. Okay. And then at a similar time, uh, you get another guy who is initially working on the neuroscience of crabs okay, and lobsters uh, and also interested in uh, doing uh, medicine, uh, trying to earn a living, uh, gets hooked up with Anton Mesmer a little bit and other people, uh, or at least by the ideas. And this, of course, is Sigmund Freud. Uh, and Sigmund Freud comes along and basically is like, oh, what we're really interested in um, is people have self-conscious rationales 
But underneath that is an unconscious psychic determinism, okay, that is pressing upon people. And the science of psychology really is about analyzing that. And he developed a method, psychoanalysis, that both then is going to spin off to become both a treatment and really what he was fascinated with was this as a method to get at the core of what psychology is about behind the self-conscious rationales into the classic drives that frame uh, the, the conscious structure. So then he wants the royal road through dreams and whatnot. So right off the bat here, what you have here is you have the explicit experience of being behind your eyes, uh, the mental adaptive processes functionally in terms of agent arena relation of an animal and environment, and then uh, stimulus response experimentation and an analysis of problems, an analysis of conscious rationale and, and a method for the unconscious structure. Um, that just gives you four. I could go on. <laughs> I'm going to keep it, you know, uh, and truncate it. What emerges in the context of this and many other fields and methods is what's called the crisis. The crisis of psychology is a documented historical phenomena where more and more people started to realize, and a famous uh, uh, articulation is, comes from Lev Vygotsky in 1927. It's like, these are totally different topics. Okay? They're totally different topics. Any layperson can tell you they're totally different topics. A science, to be coherent, needs to be able to grip its topic. Like chemistry is about the structure of atoms and matter, okay? Physics is about energy and matter across scale. Astronomy, biology is the science of life, earth science. So the natural sciences tell you what they are about, okay? With a fair degree of consensus. Now, there are great books, What is Life? Okay, so you can wonder about the edges of life and what's the fine way to define what life is. And there's debate about that. But nobody debates that life is a topic that is the science of biology. That's consensus. Okay. And what you can see in the natural sciences is a strong general consensus from physics all the way to astronomy, down into quantum, into Newtonian, other kind of mechanics and material sciences, into chemistry, into biology, all the way up to neuroscience, okay? And you have clear ontological agreement about what, what the thing in the world is. So, I mean, there's a consensual agreement about the ontology. Ontology is what is the thing in the world you say that you're about, okay? You get to psychology and that breaks. That breaks. It's documented that it breaks in the crisis, and it breaks so much that actually the field itself basically comes to define itself not by ontology, but by method. Okay. The field of psychology ultimately ends up defining itself that it becomes the science of behavior, that it the science studies and infers mental process. And then you decide based on your research program and your school of thought what you mean by mental process. And the argument is that you would never be able to be clarify what mental processes are. There's no unifying agreement about what is meant by mental process. Okay. And indeed, the field actually institutionalizes <laughs> its identity. Mainstream academic institute psychology is essentially defined in a way that says we're, to the extent we're science, we apply the methods of science to behavior and infer mental process, and there will be no unifying framework. Uh, for what we mean by mental process, okay? So that's the problem of psychology. E.O. Wilson totally overlooked it. But how is it the case that you're going to climb up the stack of coherence from matter to life into mind at animal level and at human level and into society or culture and not be able to tell you scientifically what you mean by this referent, mental, okay? Uh, but we know that we do not have a scientific grip on that. That's actually the whole history of psychology. And its grip is just based on methods now. So you open up a 101 textbook. It says, hey, we're interested in all these things. Hey, we apply the methods of science. Unlike you people that just do folk psychology, we do. And then you go on and you learn what the methods of science are. But when you go back and you ask, what do you actually mean by mental processes and behavior? It's obviously unclear. And they never clarify that it's obviously unclear or tell you why it's unclear or what that means. I'm frustrated by that. Okay. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll pause, see if there are questions here. Um, but ultimately, I locate then this problem of psychology and what I call even a larger philosophical problem of the enlightenment gap. Okay, That's the subtitle. 
the Enlightenment gap basically says, as science, and in particular physics, grabbed a hold of the world and had the successes that it did, okay, it broke our philosophy, not that there were, it had problems before, for sure, but it framed our philosophy in a way that it was extremely difficult to get a coherent picture of the material world as Newtonian physics and the epistemology of physics gave rise to a matter in motion ontology for a long time. And even when it becomes quantum uh, mechanics, general relativity, more modern physics, you still got serious problems. How do you put the mental inside of the picture of physics into biology uh, at a philosophical problem? This is the mind-body problem, okay? And defining what the mind-body problem is in philosophy of mind and other things is unbelievably chaotic. In fact, I opened my book with a little shot at the philosophy of mind that's got the same damn problems that the science of psychology has. Um, and the argument is that we have no good coherent grip on the mind-body relation uh, in general. And I argue that there's also a set of problems between scientific knowledge and what that actually means about the world and claims you can make about it in relationship to subjective knowledge. You open your eyes and have experience of being from a qualitative place and collective cultural knowledge. Like we all get together, we call this arc, and we co-construct a particular shared set of understandings uh, in the world. What is the relationship between the social construction of knowledge, the subjective experience of knowledge, and then what we say science builds to tell us about what is true? That relation is also deeply problematic. I point to the postmodern versus modern uh, debates as just to tell you that philosophy is uh, uh, uncertain or certainly no, doesn't have a consensual grip on these issues. So the Enlightenment gap says, hey, we don't really have a good grip on what science is and what it tells us about the universe, especially in relationship to subject of social knowledge. And we don't have a clear notion ontology of matter relative to mind and the mind-body problem. Given those two truths, and obviously now we can say, if that's the big abstract issue, clearly we wouldn't have a science of psychology. <laughs> How could you have a science of psychology if you don't know what science is relative to subject and mental, okay? And you don't. Uh, so I'm basically saying there's a big black hole called the Enlightenment gap. Inside of that, the epicenter of that is the problem of psychology. Everybody's groping around trying to frame this as what's consciousness? I'm raising my hand going, actually, the best way to frame it is the problem of psychology. And I figured out a way to frame that problem that I can solve it. And then when you solve that problem of psychology, a radically new emergent structure of coherence is afforded and ultimately you talk is what it is that fills that gap. So why don't I pause there in terms of just say, hey, okay, that's this problem set up and then very uh, more quickly than just articulate what you talk is in terms of how it does that. But that's the basic structure. Yeah. If anyone has any uh, questions or thoughts at this point, feel free to just uh, react with that little hand up and then I'll, I can uh, call on you. Uh, if not, well, we'll give you. If not, I'll continue. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rasmus. Rasmus yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so first, please hold me here because um, I'm um, actually coming here from an Easter celebration downstairs um, starting five hours ago. So my question uh, to you, Greg, is, and thank you, um, how do you um, differentiate biology from psychology? Right. No, so that's a really good uh, question. And then that's going to segue into um, what ultimately you talk is. Uh, and I can basically uh, point if you really want to understand you talk, okay, you can frame you talk by these two things, basically. So this book is my argument for what psychology is, and it explicitly says, here's so what psychology is relative to biology from below or from a lot. Biology operates is a science of complexification at a different dimension and a dimension beneath psychology. And I'll explain what that is. Um, there's also a culture person plane of existence. So psychology should correspond to the minded animal plane of existence. So I'm going to argue there's a minded animal plane of existence. Beneath that, is a living organism plane of existence, okay? Uh, life corresponds to the living organism plane of existence. Psychology, what should be basic psychology, corresponds to the minded animal plane of existence, okay? I'll explain what that is. 
culture person is another plane of existence, and that's what we're doing right here. So culture person is the process by which we justify and talk, okay? uh, and we legitimize what we're doing. Um, and I can show you what the, if you have, have you ever seen the tree of knowledge? If not, I may have to find that and uh, share a screen. Just dropped um, a link to it in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Uh, so you may want to check out the tree of knowledge okay, as a diagram. What the tree of knowledge says is that we can divide the universe up into different planes of existence. There's a matter plane that comes out of the Big Bang. There's a life plane. There's a mind plane, which corresponds to animal behavior. Okay. There's a culture person plane. Uh, and it creates an opportunity to clarify uh, exactly what the quote unquote joint point is, the line between biology, the science of life, okay, and psychology properly defined, which is the science of minded animals, at least in according to you talk. Okay. So, and then you have human psychology, uh, which corresponds to cultured persons, and you have to differentiate minded animals from cultured persons. And that has been confusing in the past in you talk, helps us to understand how to draw the lines between living organisms and minded animals on the one hand, and minded animals and cultured persons on the other. What that does is allows you to clarify the ontological dimension of psychological space. Maybe I can just to, I think maybe then it would make more sense that I could just listen to the rest of your talk. And then if I had some follow up, I could ask at the end of the presentation. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, that would be, we could get into that. Um, but let's see where some of the other people are and then uh, we can drive into that. But this book basically is what <laughs> spells all that out. Uh, go ahead, uh, Sashri. Uh, sir, I want. I was wondering if, like, a psychology is too desperate to like claim the status of science because it sometimes feel like we are not at the place where we can like begin to say like what is the relationship between various aspects of the mind and brain are. Like, for example, we don't really know where thoughts are. Like, where do thoughts come from? There's a theory that like thoughts are like the electric wave function in the brain, but we don't really know that. So I was just wondering if like science has always psychology has been always too desperate to like declare itself a science and like be legitimate like so that like people don't dismiss psychology at the same kind of like some kind of strange uh, strange imaginary stuff right people have been like no psychology is a science psychology is a science psychology is a science so i was wondering like if like we should think of psychology as like a study instead like we don't really know what we, we are exactly investigating just I want yeah. to just put this thought out there. I, I... No, of course. And this is actually what, exactly what happens in the field. Uh, and it's a reasonable position. OK, uh, Sigmund Koch famously, you should try if you this argument is articulated by Sigmund Koch. OK, uh, very clearly. In fact, he was a person who was a believer in the emergence of a animal drive behavioral science uh, that Clark Hall, who was a very famous psychologist uh, in the 1930s and 40s, a dominant psychologist, um, and Sigmund Koch was coming along and was believing that Clark Hall was about on the cusp of a real mathematization of animal behavior to really put it in science. And then for him, it all blew up. OK, um, and then he's like, oh, we were trying to jam psychology into the sciences in a problematic way. And actually, that's a mistake. It should be called the psychological studies. In fact, Sigmund Koch is actually part of the reason the field it's fine with a let a thousand flowers bloom. It's too complicated. We're not ready. We're too young. We don't have enough knowledge, this, this, that, and the other. And actually the field is essentially, although it's not explicit, the field has essentially bought what you're saying about the ontology. The ont we don't know what we're doing ontologically. And then, so if you don't know what you're doing ontologically, what we can at least do is do methodological based organization. So what we do is we try to apply the methods of science and you can then generate your own theory. So actually the field has sort of followed, if you pay attention to it, the field has more or less followed what you say, although Sigmund Koch wanted it to be also connecting more into the humanities um, and let lessen its grip on even the methods of science. That's why he called it the psychological studies, okay? Um, but the, the question fundamentally is, is that you presuppose with that that you can't figure out how to put it in. And I'm saying, actually, now I know how to put it in. <laughs> and once you know how to put it in, then an enormous amount of stuff gets clear and I can tell you, well, you may not be, you know, you have to now learn how you talk solves the problem. Okay. 
so here we are as investing animals in a complex dynamic system across a sensory motor loop that then builds particular anticipatory working memory structures that engages in predictive processing or what John Marie calls recursive relevance realization. And that is our procedural perspectival uh, and participatory ways of being as primates in the world. And on top of that, we have a propositional network structure that enables us to justify what it is that we're doing. And you talk helps differentiate our primate ways of being in the world and our person ways of being in the world. And it actually then says, once you start to carve the world this way, you're like, actually, there's a lot of coherence here that we can achieve and, and actually warrant the term science in relationship to them. Uh, so that's so that's the that's my reply to that um, question. But it's a very important point. It's basically the point that the field has adopted. Um, so Rosemary. I just wanted to make sure that your Utah project is provisional and open-ended. We're evolu we're evolving the the beginning of arc, the arch interdisciplinary. I mean, the idea that totally. you know, first we had disciplinarity, then we had interdisciplinarity. Now we're trying to get to arc disciplinarity. So this is this is all open ended. We don't know where we're going to end up. There's going to be new things that we won't be able to describe for a while, et cetera. So, right. That's a wonderfully important point, And I should make clear what I am saying right now is we have no coherent grip. The enlightenment gap, be aware of the enlightenment gap and the problem of psychology. They're actually institutionalized. They're actually in the structure of my discipline. I think they're in the structure of philosophy writ large. And that means we lack coherence. OK, so so we are actually in a place uh, where we lack coherence. That's the what I'm saying is, is that I'm proposing a way to achieve coherence. OK, that is not. So in other words, that an overarching picture that fills the enlightenment gap, that's just the beginning. <laughs> that is not the end. That means you actually get the think about it in terms of of a puzzle picture. OK, the argument is, is that inside when you do a puzzle, my mom's always like, hey, you got to get the frames right. Right. Before you have a frame and you don't really know what the picture is, this stuff's all over the place, okay? But something happens once you actually get the frames in. What I'm saying is I've diagnosed why their frames are missing and that we can put frames in. And when we put frames in, that's gonna afford us a much, much better and clearer picture of what it is that we're able to then do. And then we'll start the process of much more cumulative knowledge. And of course, I mean, look at biological science. We don't even know how really what happened in relationship to the transformation of chemical, you know, prebiotic structures into the actual emergence of life. That's a still a mystery. But I am saying that life is relatively coherent. We can actually make psychology relatively coherent and get the ball rolling as opposed to just being completely lost in a chaotic, fragmented pluralism. So that's the difference. And absolutely, it's a it's a beginning, not an end, for sure. James. Hi. Uh, I could see it. So you mentioned you had a criticism of philosophy of mind generally. Uh, it, it, it sounded like that was a motivation for your project. I was wondering which, if there was a specific philosophy of mind and what that criticism was. Well, uh, no, I just take a pot shot at it in relationship to the, the opening of my pre book uh, in terms of Basically, it's it struggles with, in my estimation, the basic same kind of problem from a different angle uh, that the problem of psychology does. Uh, so a, wo a woman was reviewing how to tr uh, individuals experiences in the philosophy of mind. And she basically was comp uh, saying, hey, you get into the philosophy of mind and there's all sorts of problems in terms of its, you know, what's its utility? What's its language? What's its what approach do you take? Where do you go in relation uh, so essentially, she was leveling a particular kind of critique against the philosophy of mind that I think you could level at a general level in relationship to psychology. It's it's a multiplicity of different elements without a lot of coherence and clarity. And I think it's got, um, you know, at a broad level, there's a lot of brilliance in there at particular places. But when you basically say, hey, I think the philosophy of mind does not uh, address the enlightenment gap in any cum cumulative way. Uh, so that, that would be the general structure of my critique. Although there are cool things out there like dialectical holism that might. <laughs> uh, Brandon. Hey, so I uh, just making sure that you can hear me right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, I'm rather curious. Uh, you did mention ontology earlier and that the philo no, philosophy, 
but um, psychology is uh, unsure of what their own ontology is, so I am curious as to what yours is, if it hasn't been mentioned already. Uh, I, my attention has been like waning in and out, but I, I am very curious. What is your ontology more explicitly? Good. Yeah. Uh, so that is mapped out by a thing called the tree of knowledge um, that we put into the uh, chat. Uh, so the tree of knowledge is a map of big history. Uh, map, a big history map is one that tracks the evolution of complexification on the dimensions of time uh, and, uh, well, complexification. Um, complexification is defined in relationship to the ways in which uh, there's an emerging uh, process of differentiated parts that get integrated and then operate around a whole. Um, Kyler Volk calls this combogenesis. Uh, an example of combogenesis would be the process by which, um, say, quarks uh, uh, organize themselves into protons and protons get set up with electrons and you get a hydrogen uh, atom. That's a form of combogenesis where the particles are integrated, popping together and creating uh, what uh, somebody like uh, Ken Wilber might call a holon. And you can trail the evolution of holons or, or integrated parts from things like particles into atoms, atoms into molecules, okay? And many people engage in what are called integrative levels of analysis, which basically then say, in fact, John Verveke uh, was, was emphasizing this in his uh, primary keynote lecture for the Consilience Conference called Leveling Up, is basically there's emergent processes uh, of complexification. Uh, so where you go from molecules, then you go into uh, prebiotic cells, into cells. So cells then are a whole organization relative to molecules, and they then uh, behave and demonstrate different kinds of behavioral patterns. Now, what is the jump in relationship to a molecule to a cell? Okay, you talk argues that actually what's going on there is a different kind of uh, complexification process than the process that goes on from an atom to a molecule. And it argues that actually what's happening with the jump from matter to life is the emergence of a novel information processing uh, and communication network. So the way to explain life requires uh, information processing constructs in a way that's quite different than matter. And indeed the self-organizing structure of complex adaptive systems that we call living is structured by the information processing network and communication network between cells, okay? Um, so what happens I would argue in relationship to the emergence of life is a new plane of existence whereby we see complex adaptive behavior patterns that are regulated or mediated by information processing, say within a cell around what's called a Markov blanket and then communication networks between cells. And then it is that level of organization that creates a particular kind of top-down process an information top-down process, okay? And then we get from there, you get an com increasing complexification. So you get bacteria for a long time, uh, then you get a, do a very interesting sort of maybe one-time jump from prokaryotic cells into eukaryotic cells. That's an interesting jump itself. But then we get an increasing complexification uh, through variation selection and retention of complex adaptive systems at the level of life. Now, what I argue is, is that we can trail that same kind of ontological pattern when we look at the evolution. So we call those living organisms. I want to argue that what emerges out of that in a cannibal, in the animal kingdom is minded animals, okay? A minded animal is the emergence of yet another information processing communication network, okay? In the form of the nervous system uh, embedded in a complex active body, then you get the structure of that as a sensory motor loop where the information processing communication network is now controlling and regulating the behavior of the animal as a whole, okay? And this is certainly a layer that Aristotle sees very quickly in his scales of nature. He says things that are living, and then there are sensory motor animals and ultimately rational persons. So this is many, many cultures identify animal behavior as a totally different kind of dimension. So what I'm saying is, is that actually what's actually emerging is a novel information processing communication network that exploded onto the scene in the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion was about 520 million years ago. What you have prior to the Cambrian explosion is distributed sensory motor systems, okay? And planaria-like worms, you start to get a bilateral body shape. And then all of a sudden what happens is there's an explosion of complex active body plans and sensory motor looping. 
And I believe that the argument is to be made is that what you get really is prey predation and mating relations in territory defense structures. And these are regulating the behavior of the animal as a whole. It is that core jump. And you can specify it with the same basic logic that emerges between living organisms and matter to say that minded animals emerge out of living organisms. So that cuts a joint in nature by saying it's an emergent information processing communication networks that gives rise to a whole dimension called mindedness. There's a minded animal. That element begins to then can grow essentially from crabs and, and flies all the way up to primates. Okay. And I argue you can track the evolution of animals from reacting animals to learning animals to thinking animals broadly. And this is an increasing complexification of the nervous system and the body structure. Okay. And then ultimately what you get to us as hominids is going to give rise to another emergent energy information processing structure when we get symbolic and tactical language that sits then on top of our neuro information structure. And ultimately there's another jump another complexity building feedback loop. And the first, the first key insight that led to you talk was what is it that caused us to be primates on the one hand, build broken symbolic language and then get symbolic and tactical propositional language. And why would symbolic and tactical propositional language pop us into a whole nother dimension of complexification? The idea called the justification hypothesis specifies what would be the mechanism. Justification systems theory makes the claim about human consciousness relative to culture and what is the structural function relationships with that? Why do they have that way based on evolution? And what it does then is it clarifies cultured persons as cleanly differentiated by minded animals, as cleanly differentiated uh, by living organisms situated in a material universe as emergence of information processing communication networks mediated first by genes and cells, then by nervous system and complex active bodies, and ultimately by symbolic propositional language, question answer dynamics and the emergence of uh, justification systems, uh, which are capital C cultural dynamics that give us things like ARC, uh, ultimately, uh, especially embedded in technology, and get us to come together and say, hey, what's our justification for why we're having this conversation? I would also like to point out in a Hegelian sense that all of cosmic evolution has led to ARC. Uh, so keep that note. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and Ultimate true. <laughs> no. Um, th yeah. Wow. Um, do you want to jump to James or? Uh... Yeah. Okay. So that would be, uh, unless there's a follow-up question there, I hope I, you know, kind of was able to articulate that. Okay. Uh, great. Go ahead. James. Yes, I have a follow-up question uh, to that question of ontology. So uh, ontology usually concerns describing what exists fundamentally and then how what is fundamental becomes other things. Um, it sounds from your story that you just told that information might be fundamental. It also sounds if I was to put a name on it, um, just hearing that uh, kind of contention, it sounds like scientism because the entities that you posit as being uh, featuring directly in your ontology are exactly the entities that are posited by the sciences. So then there's an obvious question that comes up. What's the relationship between them? Uh, is there a supervenience relation such that one level depends on another? Uh, uh, what is more fundamental than other things? Um, usually in ontology, the, the fundamental levels aren't the exactly the features of the sciences, but something underneath them that is unseen but inferred. Um, so but yeah, I wonder if you could clarify that a bit. Yeah, no, that's a, I, I, in my book, I, um, I think we have to be very careful about language. I try to be very careful about language about what I'm talking about. Uh, I make a distinction between fundamental ontology concerns of people like Heidegger had and other and many historically, you know, when you do fundamental as a metaphysics uh, at its core to core, uh, the ultimate nature of being itself. OK, and, and then analysis of being itself um, is one kind of ontology uh, and when reference for ontology, I'm actually advocating for a descriptive systematic metaphysics that clarifies scientific ontology in its consensual form. OK, so basically what I'm saying is, hey, um, I'm not using the term ontology to get to the absolute ultimate nature of being. I'm using the term. And this is something that um, Lawrence Calhoun talked about 
and his sort of developed a system, a systematic metaphysics is what he called it. I call mine a descriptive metaphysical system. I want to look at the concepts and categories that scientists are using to map nature. And I want to see how organized they are in sort of a Wilsonian consilient sense. I will argue that the ontology in the common sense way breaks down completely when we get to psychology. So there's no coherent ontological referent for psychology in the simplistic sense of what is it, the thing in the world that you actually refer to. So in this case, life then is a thing in the world that biologists refer to. It's the ontological referent that biology is defining. So I'm going to situate myself within the scientific taxonomy and lexicon, and I'm going to look at the ways in which they utilize terms without necessarily dropping into the fundamental philosophical questions about ontology, but to talk about the scientific ontology in terms of the concepts and categories that they are using to map reality. So those are two totally different elements. I'm situating myself in the scientific structure, and then I'm utilizing that to say, hey, the scientific ontology is relatively coherent at physics to chemistry to biology. Scientific ontology completely breaks down psychology. Why? And here's the solution for how that can happen. So that's what I mean by ontology. And I'm clear about that in the book. But that's a great question. To get. I appreciate you uh, helping you know, make sure that that's elucidated because people will hear ontology and wonder if it's the more fundamental kind. And I need to be specific that I'm talking about it in the descriptive kind. These are excellent questions. I'm really enjoying uh, uh, these questions and and uh, and answer. So, and also, I want to point out too that um, if we have time at the end, we can also come back to some of this if if people still want to get things clarified or dig in a little bit deeper. I actually have two questions myself at the moment. Um, uh, in order, let's see. I guess I'd say the first question is: um, so you are naming this sort of uh, the the. the the disjunctures, the discontinuities here uh, that that distinguish these different levels as being characterized by novel information processing systems. So it does seem that information plays a key role in delineating this sort of you know uh, complexification uh -huh. map. So my first question is, can you say more about what how you understand information? Like what what yeah. it, what is information? What and and how far down does that idea go? Um, it, which I think might also tie in a little bit with this kind of deeper on, on ontological question. Uh, second question, um, which maybe, you know, depending on, on if you want to get into this or not, or we could save it for later. I'm also just curious, um, you know, you, you do delineate, uh, these information processing, uh, uh, systems as, 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 uh, being what, uh, you know, demarcates, uh, life from matter. And matter and mind from life and culture from mind. Uh, but at the matter level, I'm wondering if you see information processing going on, perhaps in a way that might be something like uh, un what's called universal Darwinism or universal Bayesianism or, or quantum Darwinism, that there's some kind of information processing happening uh, at, at, at the purely material level. So two questions around information. Great. Yeah, these are great questions and I appreciate them. Uh, and uh, so let me give you my, let's just start with a basic taxonomy of four different meanings of the word information and how they apply. Uh, there are certainly more available, uh, but I'll start here. Uh, so let's start with the base. What I So um, what do physicists mean basically in a nutshell when they talk about the information black hole paradox? Okay. The information black hole paradox in physics is the question whether or not black holes suck up information. All right. Uh, why is that a problem in quantum theory? Well, the nutshell is really actually back to even to Newton. Every action should have an equal and opposite reaction. Time is, should be symmetric in physics. And therefore, for every particular event, you could potentially trace back any that differentiation across its potential history. Uh, and quantum mechanics says that that has to be true. And then the idea that black holes may have eat, eat information. So that is actually, and we don't mean practically we mean theoretically, or they, physicists, I'm not a physicist. Um, they mean theoretically. So theoretically, could you detect all that information and play it back based on action-reaction uh, across symmetry of time? You should be able to. Well, what do they actually then mean? They're meaning differentiation, okay? So action-reaction uh, and a symmetry between differentiation. So the first, and basically I would then say, well, those are, you can then think about that differentiation as the capacity to identify the differentiation with a data point. Okay, so the first definition of information I will give is differentiation slash data. Okay, um, and that certainly is present, uh, and the and the unfolding uh, of uh, differentiation uh, in relationship to data and the analysis of that uh, can be thought of. The entire unfolding of it can be placed then for some people in sort of algorithmic laws of physics, so that in some ways then 
what's going on in physics is essentially they're processing the laws of computation. Steve Wolfram, Stephen Wolfram's whole structure is to computationally model possible universes as essentially the laws being sort of algorithms that are running off of data. Uh, so in that sense, yes, the laws are almost like information processing data units, and then the data are the differentiation. Um, now, I think that's a re you know that's got a reasonable utility. Uh, I then think something fundamentally different is happening at the level of life. Okay? Yeah. To get into the level of life, we need the three other. Uh, so I'm sort of then taking differentiation and the unfolding of that uh, as as sort of a description of possible computation. With life, you get three other meanings of the word different, uh, and and then and three other realizations. I think uh, that are quite different than what's happening at matter. So the first is information processing. All right. Information processing then has an input function, a recursive structure that's going to allow computation and memory at some level storage and an output function. So that's what I mean by input. The base structure of an information is so inside my cells at my nervous system level, I've got a transduction system. OK, and I have afferent efferent neurons that are allowing output structures. And then you can arrange my neural networks in sort of a hierarchy and model it off of a computational recursivity. You can argue DNA, RNA, the protein structure of cells potentially operate that as well. Okay. Uh, and many people say the fundamental thing in life is that it functions as an organizing information processing system. And the membrane works as a Markov blanket of input output structures. And the memory of the DNA, RNA relation can be thought of as sort of coding that information, although you have to be careful about that, but that's not a bad argument. So you get an information processing. A third meaning gets to Claude Shannon's definition when he puts it in the context of com uh, communication and ultimately thinks about it in terms of reduction of uncertainty. So you can take information where you gather data and then it tells you then the likelihood that certain things will happen or reduces the level of uncertainty. This, by the way, is going to get into predictive processing, which is a very, very powerful model that says, well, actually, what's the functional organization of this network of information is that it's actually designed to reduce uncertainty and move you toward the good and away from the bad, in essence. So get you to good energy, uh, food, and get you away from predators, um, fundamentally a predictive processing. This is actually happening at the level of your cells to an extent. Uh, and, and you get Michael Levins doing unbelievable work in relationship to this and the embodied physiological intelli intelligence structure uh, I would argue biointelligence is a very real concept. And essentially, there's a hierarchical information network structure. Okay, the f So that's third is the way that it enables you to reduce uh, dis information. I mean, sorry, uh, reduce uncertainty and make predictions. Claude Shannon's work directly relates to that. If you don't know him, he's sort of the Newton of information theory. Um, it's infer interestingly, that then connects to entropy. Um, but ultimately, that's a really powerful. And then the final meaning is semantic meaning, okay? So semantic information is actually when you have a network subject that is then coalescing across the inputs and somehow then imputes the meaning about what all this stuff is. Uh, so for me, then you take something like John's recursive relevance realization, and it's like, well, how does the stuff come together to frame and realize what that is so you can then act on it? So semantic information is the process by which there's a coalescing of inputs to pull them together and to generate this is what this thing means to me, and then organize my output in relationship to that. So you get data, you get information processing, you get reduction of uncertainty, and you get semantic networks. Okay? I would argue that uh, we can understand, or really have to understand, sort of the ontological understanding of life is ultimately going to be structured in this type of metabolizing information to regulate energy input output. Mind and culture uh, will all have these basics uh, architecture. Uh, and ultimately, finally, I'll just say that I do say that the universe, the first uh, core of the universe at the beginning, uh, basically, if you factor out space and time, you run this tape all the way back, you essentially get this sort of what I call the energy information singular super force. Uh, and what I mean by that is essentially the image is what you have is the ultimate force collapsed into what are called bosons. Bosons are sort of the digit. A photon is a boson. Uh, but whatever the digit of the singular superforce is, all collapse into a singular entity. Uh, that gets us back to the beginning of the observable universe. And then there's a hot inflationary explosion in relationship to that, where that energy is now patterning itself over particular kinds of algorithmic law structures. Uh, so an energy information then into a material object, living organisms that then is completing a particular semantic information processing, predictive processing loop. 
and then mind and culture doing similar things through different you know, information process communication networks. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, still, I'm trying to wrap my head around and have been for some time around thinking about information uh, irrespective of uh, and, and, and something for which that is information, if that makes sense. It's hard to think about information in the abstract. It always seems fundamentally relative to a particular entity, but uh, we can say that for another well, time. Well, I'll just say, yeah. I, I, uh, you know, sometimes you think about information as a difference that makes a difference. Mm. And I was like, is there just difference before it makes a difference? Mm. And I was like, okay. And that's that's kind interesting. Of what I'm talking about. Um, so I don't see any more hands raised. I will just point out though, and and uh, I'm glad this sort of happened organically. That you know, you started your uh, talking about you talk talking about the problem of psychology, and I think that it's very uh, like that's a very natural, obvious way into this conversation. But very quickly, uh, one sees how expansive uh, you talk is as a framework, going all the way back to uh, the dawn of the universe, and uh, that the the problem of psychology it seems like was sort of the germ uh, to this framework that. That, uh, at this point has now become something very comprehensive. Um, so, and I'm not sure where you were planning uh, if we, if we do get back uh, to a kind of uh, presentation format, um, if you uh, had anything specifically planned, but I'm, 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 I'm intrigued to kind of see how you articulate or narrate that, how this plugs into this big history framework, which I, in some ways, again, sort of organically has already happened through the course of these uh, questions. But um, I just wanted to point that out uh, because um, as a psychologist, this is where you're, this is your entry point, but you talk as a model is, um, is quite a big, big history, big picture framework indeed. Uh, so all that's coming out. Um, but I do see James yeah. has another question. Uh, I'll, I'll respond to that yeah, yeah. and then we'll pop yeah, over to James. Sure. So yeah, this um, it's, it's actually, I believe it's important uh, to know, look at a level of abstraction that we are talking about here, right? Oh, <laughs> enormous level of abstraction. Please know uh, that my profession is a therapist. Uh, and the problem of this uh, that I that actually I'm now spelling out starts in the therapy room. Okay? Uh, and the therapy room is basically as I talk to a specific individual living their subjective lives, my role as a psychological doctor what is that? Uh, what's my role as psychological doctor? And how am I going to parse out what is and ought from a particular framework that enables me to have some kind of authority, uh, enables me to say some things about, you know, who you are as a human being? Uh, how do I hold your unique subjective ideographic perspective in the world? What are the kinds of values that I should be brought to bear? Um, and, and really, this thing starts with the problem of psychotherapy. Uh, and so the history is, and then I was like, well, Actually, instead of all these different schools of thought, um, my description and causal explanatory network for what a human being is should be anchored in the science of human psychology. Like, I need a basic, uh, simple ontology, to go back to James's comment, I need sort of a simple ontology of what you mean by a human and problems and what is this uh, structure? Uh, this is obviously what we're doing. And I didn't, have, and there was nothing there really. There were just a com complex set of schools of thought modes of being therapeutically, uh, empirical data, uh, but no, nothing uh, that would be a, a map. So anyway. Yeah, oh, and uh, I, just on that point, I, I do want to say too, that by the end of the conversation, I'd like to return to this point because I, I think this is really important. Um, it's very easy in big meta theoretical models to get into the abstract plane and then, but this stuff has such an important um, connection to lived experience and and existential reality. And as a clinic, clinical psychologist, uh, a, 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 in some ways, what you're saying is this is where this has come from. So I'd love to talk more a, a little bit or have another opportunity after some of uh, some more of this conversation to get back into that, because uh, I really I, I think ARC is also really about trying to plug in these big picture meta theoretical uh, frameworks into, you know, where things really matter for people in making sense and meaning out of the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road, as it were. So totally. I'd like to return to that. Absolutely. James. Yes. Hello again. Uh, yeah. In the interest of, I don't know, pushing the intentions of ARC, I'd like to uh, piggyback on something Brendan just said. So uh, the contention might be that there's an informed observer. Uh, if we reify information, uh, there's the possibility that our metaphysics becomes an idealism or uh, Platonism. 
so in that way, uh, it seems that we require maybe um, some kind of uh, fundamental ontology. Uh, and this has given rise to the uh, field of the metaphysics of science, which begins with uh, concepts like information, causation, disposition, laws of nature, and uh, builds up from there. And, and what ends up happening is um, it, it has uh, kind of fractured into a multitude of different theories that then can be applied to all the actual um, uh, special sciences with dramatically different interpretations. Uh, so, yeah, in that way, it seems that it's unavoidable. Uh, and I'm wondering then uh, how you would um, uh, reason regarding the nature of of information in relation to the uh, more complex um, uh, organized features of nature that result? Well, I mean, uh, to me, I guess the what I'll say to that is that the, the problem of psychology has given me a very nice reference point uh, for what level of what John Verbeke would call the optimal grip of my understanding, okay? Uh, so I'm after what I'm basically saying is, is that there is a mid level of analysis here uh, at the level of concepts, categories, et cetera, uh, that needs to be available if we're going to have an adequate deep metaphysics ontology that's going to specify fundamental things like mental causation, nature of information, et cetera, which are super important questions. We better have a reasonable, coherent grip on just everyday ontology, okay? like what's actually happening in this conversation. And we need that in relationship to what's a coherent articulation at the level of the sciences. So if natural science is going to map the world in a particular way. So that's what uh, I'm super satisfied with the depths that I achieve when I focus on a mid-level analysis of ontology, demonstrate it's unbelievably confused, rotate it around to make it confused, and see all the coherent information, knowledge, wisdom that pops uh, in that regard. Does that mean that then uh, it then it there would then be a lot of interesting avenues that I like to go into uh, and to explore certain other kinds of questions, uh, fundamental ontological questions and metaphysical questions from a wide variety of different domains? I spent a fair amount of time around quantum mechanics, general relativity, exploring the consistencies and inconsistencies in those structures. How different you know there are thirteen different major approaches to quantum mechanics. How do they understand the role of the observer and behavior and relationship to information, the nature of causation, the nature of time? Uh, those are all super fascinating questions that I find myself uh, to be exploring. I'm, I'm offering uh, this then as a mid-level grip that is missing. Uh, and then if you want to sort of say, okay, I want to really level down and get into the fundamental sort of metaphysical descriptions of information, causation, et cetera, um, I'm saying, well, let's, I'll offer this. Uh, that is missing, and then we could see what would happen in relationship to those kinds of conversations. Yeah, we go to uh, the bottom of the hour at 1.30. Uh, Sashri. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask the question, like, can you, like, for example, you talked about, like, how um, in life atom molecules are, uh, different cells are functioning, Thing in themselves and then organisms are communicating different organs communicate and then we have the brain which is like communicating the uh, country the entire organ so we, can we think of like things like consciousness like as, as improvements of like different kinds of like methods to process information so for example like we have like cell uh, communication inside the cell around dna and everything and then we have like over there we have a central structure like the brain and then we have consciousness so can we think of like just improvements of like ways of processing information. Like we are, the, the organisms are getting better and better at the way they are processing information, reacting. I think that's a, so what, I use the term complexification uh, and I, and and, I'll, and and it's totally aligned with what um, uh, Tyler Volk calls combogenesis, okay? Uh, and what, what you get there is, is a complexified differentiation that then gets increasingly organized to manage that organization, you get better and better at condensing information and organizing across the hierarchy. So you get larger and larger structures that enable the capacity of the system to be organized. I would say the nervous system is then a centralized computation system for the organism as a whole that enables a higher order level of processing. Even though plants do really cool stuff, that they don't have the centralized higher order meta organization, okay? 
Uh, and those are the kinds of things that enable uh, Tyler Volk, V-O-L-K, his book, Corks to Culture, uh, specifies combogenesis. Um, and he and I are now synced up uh, and we have a very, very similar kind of realize that we both kind of saw the same basic kind of uh, frame. Uh, so anyway, the point of it is, is that you definitely see this complexification. And I would argue you're seeing uh, um, information constructs that are consolidating that complexification across a recursive hierarchy. And, and so at that level, yep, you, I think you can make the case uh, that information is getting condensed and operated at increasingly uh, higher levels uh, of organization. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Rasmus. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I had some time to reflect um, on the first question. And um, so I'm just looking at this graph of the tree of knowledge. And I'm wondering, like, um, so for example, uh, chimpanzees, uh, a dog, a bird, um, all of these animals are like, I would also think that a bird has a mind in some way, right? So, um, so for me, I'm, um, I'm, yeah. So, so for me, when I look at it, like the mind is also in the life, like the mind is also in the bird. And so I'm just, uh, so I'm just having this struggle of how to reconcile this belief I have with the graph. Well, okay. So very, let's be clear. Uh, mind, what I'm referring to in that, that third block is called minded animals. Okay. Minded then is the property of what you see in a bird in its functional awareness and responsivity. So I, I encourage you to go to the woods and you'll see bees and you'll see squirrels and you'll see birds and the bees and the squirrels and the birds behave radically differently than the fungi and the plants. Okay. What you, the term that we should have in our vocabulary is, Oh, those are minded creatures. The birds uh, are different than the trees that they're planted on. The trees are living organisms, and they're very sophisticated in many ways, but they're not minded, okay? Minded then describes the property of the sensory motor loop, okay? Uh, inside the book, I articulate that actually we're very confused about the meaning of the word mind, all right? Mind, like consciousness, cognition, behavior, actually means many, many different things. I articulate a map of mind where there's actually three different meanings of the word. One meaning is mind one. That refers to the functional activity of organisms that the behaviors see. You see a rat in a thing pushing a, a bar. That's called functional awareness and responsivity. Okay? That's what I call that. So we, we can, and we can show that rats have functional awareness and responsivity. They also have a nervous system that we can model as an information processing system. I call that neurocognition. So inside the animal is mind 1A. That's the neurocognitive processing architecture of the nervous system. Outside the animal is mind 1B. That's the functional awareness and responsivity that we see when we observe animal behavior. And that whole thing is called mind 1, and it's called the, and it's the property of which is mindedness. Okay. Then what you get is mind two. Mind two refers to the subjective conscious experience of being in the world. Like, what is it like to be a rat from the first person perspective of the rat? That's called subjective conscious experience. Okay. This, by the way, is the reference for the hard problem of consciousness. If you, are, if you hear David Chalmers, you know anything about philosophy of mind, hard problem of consciousness is like, how do we study this subjective conscious experience of being, and how do we understand the mechanisms by which I would now use the term mind one, produce mind two, okay? The neurocognitive correlates are mind one, somehow mind one at some point starts giving rise to mind two. That's a great question, okay? Then what we have is we can follow that. I believe that that actually starts to happen maybe pretty early, even in insects, you get pleasure and pain. You can start to make that case, but it's really hard to study. And you get very different opinions, and we're not really out of place to nail down mind two. Okay, um, we can certainly say that humans have mind two. This is the whole zombie problem. Okay, the zombie problem is like, hey, can we at least imagine you don't have a mind two? Okay, um, but we can say, okay, we can imagine that, but we're pretty sure confident for very good reasons that we all have mind twos. 
One of the things about us as mind two, and that gives us access to our mind two, is that we have mind three. Okay, mind three is this culture person talking mind. So you can ask me, what am I feeling? And although I can't get the fact that this is a red moon and how my experience, I can tell you this is a little red moon. This is what this moon means because it sits in my propositional language, which goes right through the skin. And as long as you speak English, you can then hear my propositional network of justification about describing my world. So mind three exists right through the skin into mind two, which is your subjective conscious experience of being, which is embedded then in mind one, which is your neurocognitive activity and or the functional awareness and responsivity that you engage in as you behave, okay? Notice that if we say, oh, the mind, you actually don't know what you're talking about. Which section are you talking about? We need a vocabulary that says, oh, this aspect of these different parts is what I'm referring to when I'm using the term mind. Okay? Uh, and that's part of our grammar of confusion. Uh, oh. Shall we go back to Sushri? Or yeah, I just wanted to throw out the possibility if, if anyone uh, has been sitting on a question who hasn't uh, asked a question yet, yeah. maybe we can Please. jump there first. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, yeah, we can jump back to Sushri. I don't see. And I'm anyone. not following. I don't. I'm not following the chats either. I don't know. I'm not seeing any uh, okay. any response. So yeah, go for it. Go ahead, Sushri. Uh, sir, actually, I don't know if this is pushing the scope of this uh, meeting, but I was wondering, like, the biggest challenge which I think I face is like differentiating between like what is like the the neuroscientific label, in which like we are talking about molecules and how molecules are affecting thoughts and behavior. And then like the psychological level, which is like thinking about how thoughts are influencing behavior and how they are also reinforcing the underlying uh, molecular mechanisms. So like if there's a bleed through, like I'm not able to tell, like, is it because the person's acting this way that I'm uh, the, the molecules are acting in this way or that is that like the structure of the brain is like this or the molecules are firing in this manner because of that, the person is having those thoughts and behaving in this. So like this, like I feel like in this one area, this lot of confusion so you do you have anything to say about that well i mean uh, so i would say this my model of causation uh is was laid out pretty well by john verbeke i certainly support this i'd add some details to it in the keynote he talked about leveling up which is basically uh the argument that there is both top down and bottom up causation so there's bottom up causation yes the way my molecules are behaving plays a big role in what i do and we can see that very quickly if i inhale cyanide right? If I inhale a very small amount of cyanide, can go right through my system and rip apart the molecular structures that are necessary, and I fall over and die. So then my behavior, okay? But I would argue that you say, hey, right, take a sip of your coffee, okay? The justification system is carried an information network inside me. If you said that to me in Chinese, I would look at you, I wouldn't have any idea because I don't speak Chinese. But my system can process, take a cup of coffee, and that tape of cup of coffee exists at a higher order of information. And we're certainly, I live in a, in a metaphysics that says there's top down and bottom up causation. Okay. You can enter into a higher order of information causation, like justification. We, this conversation is changing your cells right now. Okay. Uh, so there is definitely bottom up and top. If you tell if you get a call and you say your mother just died, your entire structure will shift. Okay. That's higher order information. And I would argue you can't reduce the, the, the message to the molecules, okay? The message resides at a higher order and there is uh, our unfolding wave of complexification is taking place at different frequencies, okay? Uh, indeed, the periodic table of behavior somebody mentioned actually then maps the frequencies of complexification or gives you the stack. And you can just think about them at particular sizes like the radius of an influence and, and, a, and a quantum is down here, and this conversation is up here, but these things are having causal impact, and you cannot reduce this conversational causation to the quantum uh, because of the information structure, actually. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so we're moving uh, towards the last 15 or so minutes uh, of what time we have allotted for this. This has been really rich and enjoyable, though. I really appreciated this. Um, okay. But I want to start moving more towards the direction of trying to um, integrate. I mean, first of all, I'll just say there's this is such an expansive uh, model that uh, we're really 
uh, you've done an incredible job distilling it and 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 through the, con- the questions that have come up and uh, bringing in all this material. Uh, but uh, there's 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 a lot to all of this, and so in some ways we're kind of just scratching the surface. Uh, that being said, though, yeah, I'd I'd like to try to move in a little bit to trying to integrate this model with some real world uh, stuff. Um, and to set that up, I'll just uh, maybe ask you a question uh, first, which is um, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, conversation, debate uh, raging on the internet these days about uh, artificial intelligence, AI, uh, through you know the chat GPT and whatnot. Um, and one of the uh, points of discussion, uh, sometimes very heated, is whether or not these sorts of uh, AI are conscious. So I was wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit to how uh, you might find uh, use in framing some of the questions that are circling uh, around AI consciousness, um, sure. that sort of thing, through a U talk lens and what that affords. Absolutely. Uh, what, yeah, I think uh, William. I think here I can. William, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So here's another word that's really complicated: consciousness. Okay. Uh. So I we need to now be clear about what we mean by that. Um, so there's a base level meaning of the word consciousness, which actually relates to some of the things I've already said, I would argue, is a functional awareness and responsivity and a capacity to adjust in a particular context. Okay, I would argue this relates to the concept of intelligence. Right. Um, and at the level, so conscious in this way means that, oh, the thing is aware of its environment and responding in a particular way, and especially can it adapt, adjust and control various things. Okay. Now, in this level of meaning, and we use this all the time, if I were knocked out, okay, and you came home and you'd be like, are you conscious? What you mean, if I then said yes, then you would say, okay, and what you mean is now I get some detection, I respond, and and now I still might be a zombie, but I'm conscious. Zombies, the philosophical zombies, are conscious in that they show functional awareness and responsivity, okay? So we have to have one meaning of the word. The second meaning of the word corresponds to mind too. That is the actual sentient felt qualitative experience of being in the world as a subject, the taste of ice cream, the experience of redness, the joy of a sonata or whatever. Okay. That's the, that's the felt experience. And then finally, there is self-aware and some capacity to, to map uh, awareness of, and maybe even more expansive than that, multi-perspectival awareness, et cetera. Okay. So let me be clear then, artificial intelligence is obviously demonstrating consciousness at the base level. It's demonstrating some kind of contextualized functional awareness and responsivity. And that's why intelligence is a pretty good word. It's like, hey, it can respond and adapt. So I like the word intelligence. Intelligence demonstrates some consciousness in the sense that it's aware of you. That's amazing of chat GPT. It's like, hey, (laughs) it's picking up on my shit and responding accordingly. That's weird, okay? Now, for me, the issue is, okay, it's pretty clear that chat GPT is a zombie in the philosophical sense of the word, okay? I don't see how you would be able to say that it's something like to be chat GPT at this stage. But I do believe what can happen based on what they press is is that the thing can get a recursive uh, feedback loop of at least some self-monitoring, self-awareness, and self-adjusting that could emerge. And so you may have this sort of computational self-conscious recursive structure uh, that begins to emerge. So you get this sort of weird thing for us. We don't really think about us being self-conscious beyond uh, without being experientially conscious. I think that's our mindedness. I think this thing could certainly get sort of self-recursively conscious. Indeed, you're getting people saying, uh, be careful, this thing's starting to do shit we, <laughs> we didn't program. <laughs> and if we start to see it doing shit that we didn't program with a telos, and some sort of recursive awareness that it's trying to do that, I think that that's plausible at some level. And, and I, I really am quite scared of what chat GPT is going to do both to the basic infrastructure and in relationship to what it might become. And, you, and it's not, I'm not on the insider knowledge, but obviously a lot of people have signed a, a you know the petition, hey, let's stop this as, as if that's gonna happen, but hey, let's stop this uh, because this thing is gonna open up a bunch of different uh, potential problems. So I would say, that chat GPT is obviously functionally aware. It's building this potential recursiveness for self-consciousness embedded in its own action. Uh, And at that level, if that takes off, that's a recursivity that would be certainly warrant the label conscious in a particular way. But I don't think it's, I I don't think we're any close to embodied consciousness in the way we experience redness. Yeah, so you're you're allowing for uh, the use of a word consciousness 
in a way that actually doesn't have the the feeling of of being things and so you, you're kind of making that distinction I, and i, I don't see I, I certainly I'll, you know i'm a naturalist and i you know i see experience of being as somehow being binded together by the unbelievably complex neurobiological structure we have no idea how that happens the idea that you would get an emergent sentience in computational recursivity no matter how sophisticated it is at sort of the propositional level embedded in a computer doesn't make any sense to me but a recursive self-awareness looping structure does make sense to me uh and then whether we call that you know artificial consciousness uh without sentience that's the way i would describe it and then that i don't i think that's plausible interesting um all right well any I'm not saying any other hands go up. So yeah, maybe uh, just in the remainder of the time, if you could speak a little bit to, um, yeah, how does this all wind up connecting with people's daily lived experience with things that really matter, uh, that are meaningful to them and how they navigate their lives? What does this, what does this afford you uh, or, and, and others in, um, you know, in the sort of clinician's office with, with people and in the broader you know, public discourse, what does you talk have to offer that can, um, yeah, that's really meaningful in that sense. Right. I'll answer this in two ways. Um, so I'll go from just the societal level. Okay. Uh, and the basic understanding that we have societal, uh, level of, of what we are. Um, uh, actually my partner, Masia just produced a blog on you talk's theory of the week. Okay. Uh, and what that does is that what happened uh, as we live together, and she uh, knows you talk almost as well as I do, and we are partnered and we spend a lot of time uh, wondering what you talk might be. Uh, and about four or five months ago, we built this thing called the theory of the week, okay, whereby we aligned you talk's map of evolution of complexification with the week. Um, and what we do is we start on a Monday, that's void darkness day. Uh, so that's the absence of anything or whatever wherever the universe might come from, whatever contextual nothingness uh, is out there, uh, that then the universe is birthed on Tuesday, that's energy information day. And that just represents the hot inflationary big bang before it exploded into Wednesday, which is matter object day. Uh, so how Newton would describe the planets and, and things along those lines in terms of entities on a space-time aggregate scale. Uh, Thursday, uh, welcome to happy life organism day. Uh, whereby we're emphasizing the biological, natural, uh, the nature, the earth, the living creatures, cells, mushrooms, plants, etc., uh, embodying that in our own uh, lives. Biology is the discipline. Uh, then tomorrow is Mind Animal Day. Psychology is the discipline there. Uh, Saturday is Culture Person Day. Uh, and then we look at the possibility of the divine uh, and call that God Moon Day, the celestial stuff above us. Uh, either in uh, ideal metaphor or reality or whatever, but that uh, then that's philosophy, theology. Uh, and then Monday starts again. Uh, so for us, at least, in terms of an everyday, uh, certainly for me, the week just used to be, you know, okay, what the hell do I do on Thursday instrumentally? Now it's like, huh, you know, I talked about the enlightenment gap. You know, I was sort of given no real frame about what am I, am I at a, just an easy way to understand what is the nature of my existence? Well, I think now you go void, energy, matter, life, mind, culture, and I'm a cultured person being looking for what my potential is embedded in an unfolding wave of complexity. That's the narrative we should be teaching in school. And that should be a backdrop for fundamentally understanding uh, what we are. It also points to this uh, place that we're in with digital is like, what's happening here? highlights that and gives us a new grammar for thinking about it instead of just matter mind, for example, as which is a totally inadequate uh, kind of grammar for the, the complexity of the world. Uh, and that's what we got from the Enlightenment as a matter mind duality. It's really an energy matter like mind culture and now an emerging digital world that it should be the, uh, uh, so, so that's one way of framing it. Um, the other way of framing it uh, would be is more in relationship to pragmatics. Uh, so and and suffering. Uh, now, uh, those of you that follow, like John Berbeke, talks about, of course, the meaning crisis, and a lot of what we're talking there on the days of the week spits into the general sort of positive dimension of the meaning crisis. Like, oh, what's the grammar that we need all of us to kind of understand who we are and how we make sense out of it? But there's also related to the meaning crisis the mental health crisis. Um, there's a mental health crisis that's happening right now, uh, certainly in the West and certainly in the context of our youth. 
Uh, I think they, the CDC just released uh, some the latest statistics on girls in particular. And I believe uh, they may get this slightly wrong, but it was something like 56 percent of clinically significant symptoms. Uh, you know, this is a self-report, but it was 10 years ago, it was 36 percent. And then 10 years before that, 18 percent. So the responses to the similar kind of question don't exactly quote these, but the general trend is exactly this. We have, you know, 10 percent. 20%, now 50% of individuals uh, in an age of anxiety, an age of angst, okay? Uh, that's a societal level nightmare. Uh, and so you're getting clinically significant levels of anxiety and depression. Uh, and I think that there's an enormous amount of consolidated wisdom in psychotherapy that can be parsed apart from the various schools of thought and dispersed, okay, very broadly, okay? And I was president of a society for the exploration of psychotherapy integration. And my theme last year, I was president last year, my theme was toward a common core, okay, common core. And what I was trying to do is I utilized UTOC to pull out the fundamental core across the various schools of thought to delineate what's the major problem uh, in psychotherapy, which is brings people in, and psychotherapy is for adults, there's certainly a lot of relevant stuff for kids, but at a general level, What's the core of psychotherapy? You get individuals, adolescents, adults coming with anxiety and depression, what are called the internalizing conditions. Anxiety, depression, uh, relationship problems, existential angst, uh, feltness of stuckness instead of growth. These are the fundamental core that bring people into psychotherapy, okay? And I argue that basically all psychotherapies from different angles identify maladaptive patterns in thinking, feeling, relating, and acting behaviorism, psychodynamic, emotion focus, cognitive, okay? There are maladaptive patterns of thinking, feeling, acting, and relating. And we can identify a core architecture of that maladaptive pattern, okay? What I call a neurotic loop, technically a triple negative neurotic loop, okay? That, the reason you, when you put triple negative, you get to see the parts. So a neurotic loop, uh, the triple negative neurotic loop is a negative situation that hits your feeling system and elicits negative feelings, okay? That's what should happen. Negative situations should cause negative feeling, okay? But what happens to many people is then a secondary negative reaction that hates the what happened and hates how they feel about it. So they then bring a defensive coping structure, a secondary reaction that's maladaptive, often characterized by the ABCs of the triple negative neurotic loop, which is avoidance, blame, and control, misguided control. And what the person's basically doing is, I hate feeling this way, I hate this situation, et cetera. And they either try to block it off and pretend it doesn't exist, they blame self or blame others, that's the B, or they engage in misguided control because they can't really deal with it in a particular way. Okay? And as they do all of this, it's like bringing water to a grease fire, and ultimately it's going to trap them, make them worse, and that's what a vicious cycle is. So the way you respond to something makes it worse. Bringing the water to a grease fire makes sense. It's a fire, get water. But if it's the wrong diagnosis, you can make it worse. Better do nothing. Okay? So what I show is like a lot of these maladaptive patterns of thinking, feeling, relating, uh, and acting have this feature of a negative maladaptive avoidant blame control reaction to a negative situation, negative feeling. I then teach individuals in my coaching, and the whole point of psychotherapy is to shift one's perspective. In fact, then what you want to do, this is a little flashlight, you want to actually shift perspective from being in the loop to then observing the loop from a metacognitive perspective, okay? And a calm MO is a psych approach to integrative approach to psychological mindfulness uh, that's actually represented by this black dot here on the thing called the tree of life. And what it says is you need to shift outside of, the, uh, of being a subject in the loop, observe yourself, shift from the negative reactivity to calm, which is the opposite of negative reactivity, and then the acronym breaks down into adopting an attitude of curiosity, acceptance, of loving compassion, and motivated toward valued states of being. And you want to replace the ABC style, avoidance, blame, and misguided control, with curiosity, acceptance, loving, compassion, and motivated toward valued states of being. You flash the light on that reactive, it will loosen it, and then you'll afford yourself many different opportunities to grow. So transforming the triple negative arc loop into a calm MO way of being, enables you to gain a grip, enables you to see the driving force of many anxiety and depressions, release that and orient it to a much more uh, a stance of growth, of comfort, of exploration.
Uh, it's all hard to do, but this diagnoses the basic architecture. Uh, and I believe that it affords uh, a very generalizable frame. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'll also just say for my part too, uh, I think that, you know, you were describing some of the symptoms of what's been called this meaning crisis and um, the having a, a helpful framework for understanding <laughs> the world that's non-reductive, that, that isn't just, as you say, mind or matter, or, you know, I'm just a bunch of chemicals or I'm just a bunch of atoms moving around. I think that that actually has some profound psychological impacts. Um, uh, if you embrace that perspective, it can have big kind of downstream impacts on how you think about yourself and then your relationship to others in the world, et cetera. And so having a kind of leveled uh, ontology or a leveled um, uh, non-reductionistic emergent naturalistic ontology, I think can really shift people's perspectives about thinking about what they really are. Um, and I've I've experienced that. And uh, I think that that's another way I'll just uh, throw out as well that I feel like um, that having this whole kind of you talk uh, framework can be really helpful for people. I just wanted to name well, that. you mean orient toward emergentism. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're basically at at time here. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any final, uh, you know, twenty second questions, um, but uh, probably probably uh, we should we should call it here. Um, I'll just say this has been awesome. I've, I, I hope you en enjoyed this too, Greg. This has been really fun seeing people engage with this framework. I think, um, you know, it did a good job, uh, st starting to scratch the surface of what this is all about, but clearly there's a lot of depth here. Um, so maybe we can do this again, uh, or have another opportunity. Um, I'll also just plug your, you've got a podcast, you've got this book. I don't know if you want to just name a few things of where, uh, people can find more, uh, about this. Yeah, actually, I don't know. Um, uh, Actually, we're, I'm going to pull up a. We're just starting a thing called the uh, You Talk Circle, uh, so we're actually trying to build a community here uh, where individuals are um, uh, inter that are interested in You Talk, and you don't need to be like a pure believer or anything. Uh, but basically, if we're if you want to kind of come and explore a community, um, we're building a You Talk Circle. Uh, you can certainly also give you my email address. Shoot me a note if you want to gain, and I'll uh, give you some more um, information. We have a listserv. Um, we're gonna, we did a conference a little while ago. Uh, people like Danielle presented awesome stuff there. Uh, James presented, he was here earlier. Um, and we may do that again next year. Uh, of course, there's like, deep connections that I have with uh, Brendan's vi vision. Here we are in ARC and, and Corey's vision. Um, it's a really exciting time uh, for kind of people coming together and having these big picture visions, uh, affording different perspectives, playing off of each other in a constructive way. And it's a, it's been a joy here. And uh, I hope if you find this stuff interesting, uh, please swing by the circle and uh, we'll yeah. uh, connect. I'll put a link to that when uh, this goes up on YouTube. So, uh, and, and people can find that. Um, awesome. Well, Hey, Greg, thank you so much. This has been a great pleasure. And uh, yeah, uh, you have been, um, uh, I should also have mentioned this at the outset. I mean, you're a, you're a, a principal member of ARC as well. And so uh, as we go forward in all of this, um, yeah, people will be seeing uh, a lot more of you and, and your work and, and hopefully some fascinating um, syntheses and integrations consortiums that looked uh, that compare and synthesize your work with others. So really exciting okay. things uh, coming from ARC and uh, yeah, but thank you so much for taking the time. This has been and, great. And thank, thank you. you. Great thank questions, you. folks. Really enjoyed it. Very engaging, very spot on in the kinds of issues. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you all for coming out. Appreciate it. So take care, everyone. Great. Thank you.